follow up to ensure everyone gets a chance, and then uh, we'll see if we have time for a second round. The governor will be happy to take your questions in both official languages. Avant de poser vos questions, prière de vous identifier. Je vous demanderai également d'utiliser le micro sans fil. Governor Polas is now ready to take your questions. So go ahead, David. Governor, good afternoon. David Jungen from Reuters. First quick question. Um, yesterday's job numbers in the States were horrible. What's your reaction to that? Uh, do you, is that a kind of a data point you look through, or do you think, ouch? Well, we, we never offer a running commentary on single data points, and I would emphasize single data point. Um, and so uh, these data never go in a straight line. We've had a pretty straight line uh, in the U.S. labor market for quite some time, so I suppose it's got a higher surprise value, but it's, it's uh, not unusual to have that kind of variability in the data. So certainly, uh, you know, we, we'll have to wait and see how the trends develop. And secondly, looking forward to the rest of the year, how do you see the U.S. economy developing? Will it still be as strong as you think it, you, th you thought it was going to be in the NPR? Well, um, yeah, I'm, I'm hesitating to uh, go into any depth with you there, David, because uh, we're just in the midst of our next uh, forecast cycle. And uh, it was, of course, aiming for the, uh, the July uh, interest rate decision in the monetary policy report. Um, but I think that uh, we, w the things we're watching, let's put it that way, is that there's been a, been a little bit of a, uh, uh, a gap in insight. If you went through, you could you could build a case that the economy is stronger than many thought, and you could build a case that it was weaker than we thought, depending on which data you think are the most important. And you know the labor market data until yesterday were were you know showing the strongest signs and other data showing us slightly softer signs. But either way, uh, they're, all, they're all pretty good. So uh, whether it's more or less than what we had in the NPR, I, I don't want to say at this stage, because we, we're just doing our work. Kim? Hi. Thank you, Governor, for taking the questions. Kim McCrail from the Wall Street Journal. Mm -hmm. uh, this is regarding the wildfires in Alberta. During the last rate decision, the Bank of Canada uh, estimated that the wildfires could trim I think roughly 1.25 percentage points off of Q2 GDP. Uh, can, can you comment on what you expect the magnitude of the rebound in Q3 to be and what the overall impact will be on the year? So that's, uh, that's a good question, and we're not really in a position to answer it uh, yet. Um, there's a certain amount of uh, arithmetic involved that one can probably rely on. It uh, just depends on when everything gets back up to speed, but it's still uh, early days in June, and it's you know things are moving ahead. Uh, you know, it's it's a, it's a very difficult situation for people, uh, so we're watching that with a lot of interest. But and I don't want to translate that into a mechanical thing because it's all about how people uh, manage to uh, to get back started again. So, but the the mechanical part of it, or the arithmetic part, is about the oil production. So. Uh, yeah, that'll depend on when it gets back online, and so the, the the hit to the economy first is that, and then of course the recovery will be well you turn it back on again, so you know you, you get that back, and um, arguably that's something like two thirds or something along those lines, half at least of the, of the number that we gave. It's something like that. When you say roughly, very important, right? To say roughly, but. Obviously, some of it is because you've shut off oil production. So when you should turn it back on, you'll get that much of a recovery. But the rest is completely a, a, a personal thing. It's like how, to, how quickly do people get back? When do they get back to work? Um, you know, when does rebuilding begin? And all those kinds of things is very, very much up in the air. So we'll try to give a better uh, sense of that uh, in the July NPR. Until then, I just don't think we can, you know, by then, hopefully, the picture is clearer, but, and, and uh, we can make better guesses. Uh, so I think I better leave it at that for today. And, and I'll just ask you to, to make sure I've, I've understood properly what you said about the, um, the, the expected rebound or recovery afterwards. You said roughly half to two-thirds uh, of what was lost, essentially, will be got back afterwards as, as a rough sort of... No, what, what I actually, what I said was uh, around half or, or a little bit more than half of the 1.25 number that we gave you would be because of lost oil output. 
And so you could, if you wanted to say, well, I assume the oil output will go back to what it was, then you could say, well, I'd get that much rebound. And you, but you can't really say for sure that it'll happen entirely in Q3 because it's already June and they're only sort of getting started. I don't know how quickly that's going to happen. So but that puts a metric in there that there's a certain amount of arithmetic around and the rest though is much more highly judgmental. When, when do people actually get back to work? Uh, when do they begin rebuilding? How quickly does that occur? And all those kinds of things. So it's the same experience we had when we had the big floods, you know, in southern Alberta. You, 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 you pretty quickly you knew certain things had been shut off and that they would come back on. Uh, but the rebuilding was a very gradual process. And so uh, we'll have to uh, look at it hard over the next few weeks and uh, make the best uh, judgment we can uh, for monetary policy then. Thank you. Um, Yali Ndirai from Market News International. Um, so you mentioned the financial um, stability earlier, but, and in your statement from May, you said that household vulnerabilities have moved higher. So I wanted to know if compared with the beginning of the year, you're more concerned today about uh, household vulnerability of their trend than you were at the beginning of the year. Uh, well, um, if, fair enough. It's true that in the uh, the last uh, interest rate announcement, we indicated that those vulnerabilities have moved higher, um, and and it's obvious from uh, from the data that they have moved higher. We're uh, just finalizing our full analysis of those risks, which will be published uh, next Thursday in the FSR. And so I think we'd be much better prepared to have a, a dialogue around how those risks are evolving at that time. It's just next Thursday, so I don't think I should front run uh, that, especially when we are just finalizing uh, the text that we'll be putting out at that time. So the second question was uh, uh, in relation to your expectation for exports. And uh, your statement said that um, you do expect a rebound in the U.S. economy, and I wanted to know if you're still confident in that and uh, in how it's going to help export, given that expectations for the Fed have shifted and, and so for, for the Canadian dollar as well, and it <laughs> would be less supportive maybe. Okay. So I'm, I'm simply not going to update you on all of those things uh, today. Uh, we've just opened up our next forecast exercise, which we'll do that over the next uh, four weeks or so. Um, and uh, what is important, I think, is for us to remember the context. Uh, the, um, if I think back six months or so, uh, we had the uh, monetary policy report in January, and um, that was at the time when we had all the concern about China and the stock market was falling and the Canadian dollar was, was weak and all those things. And we put out a forecast which we thought uh, could see through the volatility and people thought that the bank was too positive. And then three months later, all the uh, relief rally had kicked in. Everything was uh, sun sunny again. And um, the bank in its new forecast in April said some of that uptick was a rebound from a weak fourth quarter and therefore would not continue. Some of it was a special factor in the first quarter, so it would not continue. And so the judgment was that the bank was trying to be uh, too gloomy. So I think what that tells you is that in general what we look at is the longer and bigger trends in the economy. So we don't get thrown around by short-term fluctuations in data series that are very volatile. So at this stage, I'm not going to give you a summary judgment of the U.S. economy, um, but uh, but, uh, uh, and we are just, as I said, doing our updating now for the next uh, exercise. Uh, but I would ask you to conti con continue to think, bear in mind that context, which is that we are in a very volatile context. And so the, econo the economy is not as volatile as the data. That much we know. Greg? More broadly, I think the year began with the idea of policy divergence, a term I think the bank laid out, and, yeah. and there, was a, there was a broad expectation, I think, that the U.S. was going to 
diverge from Canada and, and other countries are going to go in different directions. Where does that idea of divergence stand now and how does that affect how our economy evolves from here? Well, uh, I, you know, again, I'm not going to update on what the U.S. situation may or may not be. Um, but I think that the idea that uh, we were laying out in that, uh, in that talk in January uh, remains intact. That is, that the U.S. is still in a, in, a, in a space where they're looking at whether or not they will tighten. We're, we're in that space. Um, we were in a situation where the Canadian economy has had some persistent uh, weakness, and, uh, and that was exactly what we talked about there. So the, the oil price shock is a significant setback for the Canadian economy, and we said it would take a couple of years uh, or longer, possibly three years, for that adjustment to take place. And uh, that is exactly the kind of uh, shock which leads to divergence between economies. One's a major importer, and the other one's a major exporter. Therefore, one goes, one is shifted down a little while the other one is shifted up a little. Um, so that divergence in fundamentals is, is intact. So those shocks are still working their way through the system. Uh, whether that means uh, a minute by minute or day by day, a divergence, convergence, all that, you know, that's, that's all about the bumps and wiggles that we're talking about here. The data are volatile. So views on, in the market uh, about what uh, policies might do change virtually every week. That's the, the data, data dependency that we all hope is. So that's what markets are for. Um, and uh, so our job is to continue to do our analysis to see our way through that volatility and, and uh, focus on getting the trends right. Uh, secondly, on, on the lecture today, you, you laid out this case for uh, uh, inflation targets and uh, mm -hmm. The experience we've seen through 2008 where in the background debt can build up um, and how maybe coordination is, is a good idea. How, how can that be applied to the future thinking of the bank account and other central banks that, that seem to still like inflation targets as the anchor of, of policy but realize there are longer term questions that they can't really get at? Yeah, so um Basically, uh, you know, I was talking to a room of the, the most high-powered uh, academic researchers in the land. So if, if nothing else, perhaps I've uh, excited one or two of them into working on some of these issues more. Um, the bank will, of course, continue to work on these issues ourselves and uh, hopefully in collaboration with academics. Uh, but it basically, what I'm arguing is that the models that we use today don't have all these complexities that we have become, you know, in the past you might have thought, well, those complexities are there, but they're just not very important. Uh, they come and they go, you know, they're, they're just part of the, the background. Uh, but I guess as a product of the long duration of the, the shock we've been living through and the fact that it's a downward shock, which brought us, you know, many central banks to in the neighborhood of the lower bound. A number of these issues have become, they've just simply grown in importance and it's given rise to this, uh, this dialogue. Not a, it's not a debate or anything, it's just a dialogue around, well, what's missing in our models? You know, uh, what is it about the, that was going on that we, uh, the, the, the inflation targets didn't protect us uh, from this kind of outcome? So, um, and so that means that the models need to have more of these stock flow interactions. Many models simply don't have those. Like the Bank of Canada's model, I'm very lucky to be able to work with one that's got that kind of articulation. Um, it's, it's rare, especially with the commodity price stuff all in there. Um, so um, that, that in itself is a major leap forward, but it doesn't have the kinds of things I'm alluding to here. And uh, you know, now that they, we now understand more how important they are, my, my talk today was a modest contribution. It was just to say, well, now, you know, you, you don't just observe that this debt stock goes up while this one doesn't. What you realize is that that's actually a, a, a formal implication of what policy mix we've, we've moved into. And a lot of that policy mix happens kind of, as I said, by itself, like it's not so, you know, the economy kind of takes you there. And uh, then around the edges, you have the possibility of perhaps 
in certain search situations, reorienting. And in that, uh, in that setting, then, that, that just raises our awareness, I think. It makes us feel a little better. We have a stronger understanding of, of how those processes interact. And so we'll be you know, a little more attuned to that in the future, I guess. That's and as far as I can go today. But I'm hopeful that uh, you know, others, other uh, actual researchers, as opposed to me, who I'm, I'm not anymore, uh, will take come a couple of those ideas and push them further. And so it will help us to uh, build stronger models that give us uh, a, you know, a more refined context in which to think about policy decisions. We'll go to the back, Andy. Andy. Yes, hi, Governor Polos. Um, there's been lots of discussion recently about whether a coordinated economic approach uh, to ad addressing the stagnant global economy would be beneficial. Uh, just, you sorry, know, Andy, did you say a coordinated approach? Yeah, okay, well, a coordinated. Sorry. You know, we've heard yeah. this at the G7 meetings yeah. recently, and right. I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on some form of international coordination uh, in this sense. Well, you know, uh, we, we live in a, uh, in a flexible exchange rate global financial system. And so, uh, you know, at the heart of that is a set of policies where, you know, uh, for authorities are mandated to work on their own objectives, their domestic objectives. And in the normal course of events, um, flexible exchange rates then kind of compensate for things that may be happening in one country and not another country. So like I was talking before about the oil price shock, you know, as a negative unambiguously negative for Canada, unambiguously positive for the United States. So what would you expect? You would expect the Canadian dollar to do some of the adjusting to that, and that's exactly what has occurred. So that's what a flexible exchange rate system is for. Uh, but there are times when uh, there is something which is uh, more shared, and that's when policy coordination becomes you know, much more likely uh, to be of help. So an example would be in 2008 when everybody had the you know, the global financial crisis in its aftermath, and there was a perfectly coordinated monetary and fiscal response. And, you know, the, this was for history book writers, but I'm sure that will conclude that that prevented the Second Great Depression from happening. Now, that, that, those forces that would have given us the Second Great Depression are still there. They're, I'm, I have no doubt they're easing. Those headwinds are easing, but they're still there which is to say that monetary policy is still having a big effect, keeping it away. So since there's that commonality, there is, a, there is a commonality to the discussion. So there is that sort of sharing of experience. That's a, that's a sounds like maybe like a weak form of coordination, but it's a very important one. So when we get together with central bankers in Basel, we can talk about, well, what are you seeing, and what are you seeing, and what do you think is next, and et cetera. That, that level of coordination is extremely valuable. Because it's a sharing of, of well, what are you saying and what what is your what is your how will you think about it if this if this happens next? Uh, more explicit forms of coordination, as I said, are pretty rare because they, hap they happen when there's something big, it's shared, and so on. And uh, and and in a way, it's it's a little bit off to the side because um, you know in in the in the limit, if 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 the needs for policy are different in one country than in another. Coordination is actually the opposite to what someone is looking for, because it means somebody must be, in a way, letting their objectives be for a little bit of time in order to play the global coordination role. So when there are differences, and that's why my topic in January was about divergence, it's that the world economy is at a stage where there's a lot of differences. And the commodity price shock really accentuated some of those differences. And so it's the kind of environment where coordination isn't that natural of the, time, the kind I think you have in mind, active policy coordination at the international level. And so, uh, but I still think it's um, whether you do something together or not, getting together and sharing those views, and in the context of G7, you've got both monetary and fiscal. So you've got a, a much uh, more fulsome discussion than you have when it's just uh, central bankers. But still, you are, are looking at um, understanding better what everybody's seeing. And that is very valuable. So it's a weak form of coordination, but a very important one. Thanks. And we have one last question. Courtney? As the uh, it's, it's Courtney Tower 
market news. As the, uh, as the impact of monetary policy gets less as, as you get down to zero, um, and uh, there's, in Canada at least there's a renewed move to uh, fiscal stimulation, do you worry that given the huge provincial debts and the large federal debt, there's a there's a, there's a there's a risk of going too far in 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 in, in fiscal stimulation, mm. or or where would you kind of see a a level of uh, safety being exceeded? Well, that's an interesting question, Courtney. But I but it is a purely a fiscal question. It's probably not my place to answer that judgment. Um, but I will say that uh, the in, in the context of the paper that I discussed today, um, what we're looking at is um, a situation where the mix of policy going forward, if it has a little bit more fiscal, which is what we've uh, we've uh, now have in place, um, given where we are today, that is preferable to having lower interest rates and no change in fiscal at this in this situation, because of all the things you mentioned, such as the, uh, the, the uh, uh, imbalances in the household sector and so on, and the fact that interest rates don't deliver much when you're that low already. Uh, and we know since the writings of Keynes that fiscal policy delivers the most impact in this situation of any other uh, because interest rates are so low. So in that, in that very limited kind of sense, that, that shift in mix is, is a small one, but a, a very positive one. I've said that before. Um, but uh, to comment then on how that affects debt, which, which the government has already laid out how it affects the federal government debt, uh, the provincial debt is a whole other matter, which I simply won't comment on. Okay. That, that's, that's all the time we have. I'm sorry, folks. So we're, okay. we're out of time. That will conclude it.